Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to IXL Business Center Innovation Award. Sorry, welcome to IXL Center Business Innovation Webinars, How to Build a Bionic Company, Steps to Drive Digital Transformation and Scale It Up. Presented by Dr. John Spiokla, IXL Advisor and Global Thought Leader on the Bionic Organization. I'm Dr. Dana Wells, your moderator for this webinar. During the next 60 minutes, John will present on this fascinating topic. Your lines are muted. However, please use the dialogue, uh, please use the questions tab in the bottom right corner of your dialogue box to type in your questions as we go. You will also use this box to type in technical issues and our team will address them. Throughout the presentation, John will pause, ask for questions, and I will propose those questions during the session. If we do not have time to answer your questions, our team will respond to you in a follow-up email. Now, John, over to you. Thank you, Dana. It's such a pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, happy Monday. It's, uh, it's, it's a real thrill uh, to share with you some of the information and ideas we have about how do you really deal with digital transformation, the bionic transformation of your organizations. And uh, we're gonna recap a little bit, uh, and, and then we're gonna go into new material. Uh, for those of you who have joined us before. And Dana, it's lovely to be here with you. Uh, let me get on to the slides. First, we're going to talk about uh, the objectives for our day, uh, which is to really uh, give this notion of digital transformation, bionic transformation, some examples, some use cases, make it real. Second thing is to introduce tools, techniques, how to create innovation at scale. And that's really important because there's really two separate innovations. There's the innovation of the thing itself that customers love, and then there's getting it to grow and grow fast, especially in a large established organization. Both of those are hard problems and, uh, and, and really things that uh, is actually the reason I partnered up with IXL because IXL knows how to deal with both of those. And then the, the last thing, of course, is the tactics of getting started, uh, best practices and so forth. So let me run you through our agenda, how, how we get to these objectives. We have four things. We have a recap of the last webinar. Uh, as they say, repetition is the mother of learning. Uh, success and failure stories of digital transformation, uh, bionic, and we have some roadkill and we have some survivors and thrivers. Uh, then a really fun and interesting topic, at least uh, in, in my world and how I think about it, which is how do you really create innovation at scale? And because a lot of people can create new innovations, a lot of them die in the belly of the beast. Uh, and then the last thing uh, that's really important is how do you prepare uh, individually and also your organization to get ready in this bionic era? So let me just stop there a second. Dana, did I forget anything important or miss anything? No, you're spot on. Please All right. continue. All righty, thank you. All right, so. Uh, for those of you new to this or who joined us last time, um, I'm super uh, excited about this, this notion of going from the industrial to the bionic era. What is the industrial era? The industrial era is about human power and, autom and animal power and automation happening by machines. The bionic era is really that same idea, except with a superly important new thing, which is it's a new dialogue between people and machines. The industrial era was a monologue, you know, suck the knowledge or the power out of me or an animal and stick it into the machine. The bionic era does that. And it also, you really have a dialogue. You think about uh, somebody who's driving a, a, a first class, you know, war plane nowadays. Sometimes the pilot's driving, sometimes the machine is driving. Sometimes the pilot's dealing with the weapon system, sometimes the machine is dealing with the weapon system. That kind of dynamic allocation of decisioning and decision rights is really different in the bionic era. In addition, you get a whole digital description, a digital twin of reality, which you didn't get in the industrial era. These are two very important distinctions. Uh, so it's automation on super steroids with new dimensions that is really changing the economics of, of the world. Um, and uh, I, I find it pretty exciting. Um, what did these, what does this new kind of bionic um, capability allow and create, as you remember from last time, for those of you who are with us, the, uh, you have new forms of capital. If you think about industrialism, industrialism uh, and the industrial revolution was really about uh, financial capital, human capital, and natural capital, you know, oil and water and so forth. 
And then as we go into the bionic era, we have new kinds of capital, which is behavioral capital. That is, what is the modeling of your behavior, your preferences, or the assets in your business uh, and how they behave? Cognitive capital is the automation of thinking tasks and network capital. That is, how do you spread that over time? So let me just give you a quick example. You look at you know, somebody like a, a, a Facebook, right? Behavioral capital, they have models of what I'm interested in, what my social network is and so forth. And they adjust, uh, for those of you who use Facebook, you know you can get uh, lookalikes. So you can get people who behave exactly the same way somebody else does. And those are the people you can advertise to. The cognitive capital is what goes on my newsfeed and all that other stuff is a set of algorithms that are completely automated. You don't have human beings in the middle of that. And then you think about the network capital, they have two billion people that they can self-organize around. Uh, and there's even talk of uh, uh, Facebook launching a global currency on its network. It's that, that powerful and interesting. So it's just, if you step back and you look at some of the most highly capitalized companies in the world, Alibaba and Tencent in China, you know, Facebook and Google here in the U.S., it's really centered on these new forms of capital. And those organizations who are transforming those, the old industrial organizations, are learning how to use this stuff. So, but here's the challenge. So that's the opportunity. Here's the challenge. And this is the part that uh, that creates competitive opportunity and also makes leadership uh, important. Uh, organizations, if you look at the little green line down the bottom, this is from my friend Chunka Moy, who wrote a series of fantastic books. This one comes from his book, Unleashing the Killer App. And Chunka talks about the opportunity as being in the gap, in the gap, mind the gap. And you mind that gap between uh, how fast and capably most organizations change, which is a little green line down the bottom there, um, you know, basically moving at a, you know, incremental change speed. And then you have the bionic opportunity, which is how, how fast are things happening out in the marketplace? And we'll give some examples of companies that have failed and succeeded at this. But that's the opportunity, because the way you close that gap is through strategy and leadership and execution. Uh, so the, put another way, look, the opportunity is out there. The question is, can you go get it? Um, and, and, and that is a challenge. Um, so let's just look at some things. Um, let's take a look at a company like Macy's, you know, who were one of the great innovators in retail. If you go back in retailing history, you know, Macy's in New York City, spectacular, you know, innovator in the industrial age. And you could see the internet coming and e-commerce coming from a mile away. It's been happening for over a decade. I used to teach at Harvard Business School. We taught the first electronic markets course in 1994 and five. So here we are in 2012, 13, 14. So 20 years later. And Macy's is seeing their revenue and their departmental store market share decline, 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 decline. And this is after they have consolidated a tremendous number of retailers. Uh, my home, I'm from Brockton, Massachusetts in the US. Um, my hometown, uh, you know, is Boston. Boston um, had uh, Feline's get absorbed by Macy's. I'm now out here in Chicago uh, to see my granddaughter, you know, Marshall Field. So you see that even with the consolidation, Macy's just kind of losing the plot. And you have the Chicago Tribune uh, was not able to, even despite buying a number of other uh, entities, was trying to become successful in comparison to the New York Times, which I'd actually had the opportunity to do some consulting work for the New York Times back in 1998. They're successful because they really saw the uh, the need to have behavioral capital and network capital and cognitive capital drive and transform. So they're one of the great brands that survives and is even thriving in this environment that has a lot of desire for new news. Um, so I'm going to also uh, talk about uh, some, some ways that people are being more successful uh, along the lines of the New York Times, not the Macy's or the Chicago Tribunes of the world. So let me just uh, stop there for a second, take a pause. Dana or uh, Yulia or Jan, anything that I should be answering or covering here, or should we dive into these examples? Uh, yes, John, while these are some great forms of capital, um, I have a question here. How can organizations assess their BCon and who should be in the room helping them do that? Yes, great question. Uh, thank you for that. The um, and by the way, for you, for you folks listening, I don't always say great question. If I don't say great question up front, it means I just think it's a mediocre or worse question. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, the people who have uh, access to this information now are usually a combination of the marketing department, the operations department, sometimes the human resources department, 
and for, for physical goods companies, the supply chain area. And so when you think about what is the behavior of, let's say, John Deere, the tractor company, they have the behavior of all of their at new assets that are out in the field. So whether it's a combine or a tractor or your lawnmower, they have the ability to track that behavior, at least in the capital equipment, and understand how are people using it? When is it getting used? Where? How's it working? Is it getting sick? Does it need to be repaired? Uh, elevators, same thing. Otis Elevator has a complete model of what your elevator is doing in your building if it's one of the ones that has been hooked up. So that's a combination of those folks. So any company needs to think about what are their assets and their people doing and how do they model those. And if you have a better model than the competition, uh, you will win. Then in terms of cognitive capital, we have uh, two things going on with cognitive capital. We have um, the automation of simple things, what's often called robotic process automation, where you're just taking repetitive tasks and using new software to automate that and improve it. Super important in terms of driving the productivity of people in your organization. Then the other side, uh, and I think of that as kind of like picking up the trash. So you have the robots picking up the, the, the process trash, if you will. And then on the other side, you have the robots helping you look at the stars. So you look at uh, new uh, uh, diagnostics, for example, is a new uh, set of activities happening in some of the Boston teaching hospitals now where a combination of AI and radiologic images is improving uh, early detection of breast cancer five years before the onset of significant breast cancer, 30% better than the, than the um, radiologists themselves without the AI help. So. Uh, the cognitive stuff helps you pick up the trash and look at the stars. And then the network thing is very, very important in terms of you need a strategy for how to get onto the digital networks. Uh, there are the, the nine major ones around the world, Tencent, Alibaba, uh, JD, Baidu in China, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, um, Facebook, and uh, uh, what's the, forgetting the fifth one in the US, uh, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, Facebook, and Apple, sorry, uh, and Apple uh, in the US. And so, oh, not just the US, in the Western world. Uh, and you need a, a strategy for how to deal with them uh, uh, either way. Uh, Dana, did I answer the question? You did, and, and I, I don't have any more questions. Please continue. Okay, very good. So uh, let me take you through. This is kind of a fun example. I've been in North Korea for a little while now. Talk about capturing behavior. Uh, you know, Tesco Home Plus uh, has the ability, while you're waiting for a, uh, a train, to use just a, a wall as inventory. And this young man here you can see is uh, uh, ordering uh, goods that will be delivered to his home uh, while uh, he's using the, you know, the, the spare time between uh, when he's waiting for a train. Uh, so uh, this notion of, you know, how do you grow without increasing the asset base, without uh, buying new real estate and so forth, this is a great way to, to grow. And you can see some of the out, outcomes. You've got an increase in online membership uh, and online sales by 130%. If you know anything about a retailer, uh, especially a food retailer, those numbers are spectacular. Uh, so really a combination of uh, behavioral, uh, cognitive, and network. Uh, Disney um, uh, has spent over a billion dollars on wireless magic uh, bands to be able to customize and informationalize the uh, uh, experience in their parks. So, you know, their ability for uh, customers to uh, understand what's going on, to check in, to spend money uh, by using the RFID technology, again, uh, enabling behavior uh, and offer design through cognitive activities and cognitive capital, uh, you can see a 90% improvement in satisfaction rating. And when you think that's happening at Disney, where satisfaction is already very high, that's truly impressive. Um, then one of my favorites is, is this bad boy here, which is that uh, you take the dumb, uh, unconnected, uh, industrial, uh, you know, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Vending machine. Yes, um, that it over here on the left, and in you know, you send human beings out to query it, look at the inventory, fix it, and so forth. Over on the right, Kraft Foods has engaged with 
Intel to create the smart vending machine. So each of these is connected. Uh, it's got new interaction technology, face recognition, social networking functions, uh, and then uh, with intelligence on the machine itself. So here you have the ability to capture and influence behavior, use cognitive capital uh, through AI, and then create a network of activity because when you start to look at um, the nature of uh, retail penetration uh, with vending machines, uh, you can look at it vending machine by vending machine. That is, gee, you know, in this particular, uh, you know, office building, we've got 10 vending machines that do this kind of business. If you go up a level, you can actually look at the network effects of having brands and availability across different vending machines in a given geography. Same phenomenon has been uh, documented in retail experiences and, and, and also in certain kinds of leasing where uh, a, a, a smart developer will take um, you know, 10 or 15 buildings and have one leasing agent to get coverage. So that same thing you can take down to the different vending machines. Uh, impressive. And then, of course, the incremental productivity of these assets if they're full. Because if I walk up and I want peanuts and there's no peanuts there, that's a lost sale and this can help decrease that. So the incremental productivity of these assets for craft and the, and the brands going through them are fantastic. Um, so very important. Um, you know, just something to think about uh, here uh, where the world's taxes, largest taxi company doesn't own vehicles, it coordinates them. Uh, world's most popular retailer is just starting to own stores. Uh, you know, uh, they've got some, you know, we say owns no stores, they have some, uh, but compared to their mothership, they have very few. Uh, world's largest media company really uh, doesn't own content, but again, Facebook's starting to vertically integrate into content, but certainly started with none. And then the world's largest accommodation provider is Airbnb and owns no real estate. Uh, you know, who knows, maybe over time, they'll, they'll have a, a, a toe in the water the way Amazon and Facebook do, but um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of this notion of, if you have behavioral cognitive and network capital, you may not have to own the uh, physical assets, certainly not with the intensity you used to. Okay, um, any questions or thoughts there? Because we're gonna get to uh, creating innovations at scale. Let's have a recap and a, I hope an invigoration of the bionic ideas and just how vital they are. Any, Please any? type in your questions. I don't see any questions right now. I think everybody's so engaged with these new wave ideas. So let's Great. continue. Awesome, right, or, or up getting a beer at the fridge, one or the other. The, um, <laughs> um, the uh, so let's say that you've created a bionic innovation that you figured out how to model behavior, have some new network offering, do something together with Facebook or Alibaba that the customers love. Now, how do you scale that inside the, a large organization? Uh, large organizations, I, I've been a student of organizations my entire professional life and um, the one thing that the dirty little secret about large organizations is they hate variance. Uh, when you think about the industrial activity, the industrial activity is really about decreasing variance, increasing predictability and growing volume. And so uh, just like these poor uh, gentlemen in the, in the shell here, uh, this quad that they're rowing, uh, you, know, you do not want variance. You want everybody in lockstep. You want the timing the same. You want things out in a very, very predictable manner. The, uh, at the same time, innovations are all about variance, about new things the customer wants, new ways of going to market, new changes and capabilities, because that's where the value is created. So at its core, I think it's a very simple tension, uh, complicated to deal with, but simple in its concept. And that tension is between the, the phenomenal drive by everything industrial toward standardization, decreasing variance, whacking down the high nail so that they're all even. And this is true of, uh, of budgeting processes. You want to have predictability. This is true of um, the uh, quality processes. If you think about quality, quality is fundamentally at its core about decreasing variance around a mean and getting increased controllability. Yes, it's aimed at customer value, but you want to control everything. And creativity and newness and so forth increases variance. It has, increases risk, but it also increases opportunity. And well managed, it actually increases expected value which of course is risk times opportunity. So you can have some uncertainty, but if the prize is big enough, it's worth it. So 
when you think about this, how do you design a system that supports variance inside an organization that is designed to stamp it out? You know, it's, it's really pretty, when you step back and look at it, it's really kind of a, a wacky and important thing you have to do. At the same time as an executive, you have to drive for consistency and predictability, and, at the, and that's part of your day, and another part, of your day you have to figure out how do I actually do that but have the proper variance I need so I will survive and thrive in a changing environment because I would predict to you that we are in the uh, we're in the middle of the start of the bionic era the bionic transformation and I would say to you there's only going to be four ways to make money going forward or of course there's lots of ways but I believe four central ways to make money going forward are first of all to start a bionic company Second of all, the transform an industrial company into a bionic company, like the New York Times, not like the Chicago Tribune, to, uh, to be the, the folks who um, chop up the existing businesses, because there will be money chopping up the dead industrials. So you look at a, comp uh, a retailer in the United States like Kmart, uh, some of the investors in that have made a lot of money basically dissecting what's left over whether it's the real estate or the assets and so forth. And so there'll be a, an opportunity to make money recycling dead industrials. And then the, the fourth thing will be to think through what are the secondary implications of, uh, of different activities. So, for example, right now in the near term, uh, there's uh, there's been a lot of worry about uh, drivers in the United States uh, being out of work because of self-driving cars. Well, that may be true in the long term, but right now in the United States, there's a massive shortage of drivers for the reason that as computer systems get better on predicting the last mile and as Amazon and others do more delivery to individual homes, the uh, creation of uh, the bionic uh, you know, cognitive and the network and the behavioral capital is actually driving incremental demand for drivers because there's more uh, individual deliveries uh, than there were in the past. So you have to think through the true secondary implications, not the expected ones. Uh, and so, so that's important. Uh, so given those four ways, uh, start bionic, transform, uh, chop up the dead industrials, or uh, think about the true secondary implications, you need an organization that can both optimize uh, the existing business as well as reinvent it. So that's this notion of how do you design a system that supports variance. And I'm going to say to you um, that that this is creative as important and as difficult as uh, creating a new innovation in a product market fit sense. Um, so uh, put another way, any innovation inside a large organization has two innovations, and most people only recognize one. The, the first innovation, which is super important and you can't do anything until it happens, is the creation of the actual new thing that customers want and what they love and are willing to buy and so forth. And then the second thing is how do I then design what I'm calling here the structural variables so that you can allow and encourage the proper variance in the context of a large organization and how you can really uh, blitz scale at scale in, inside a large existing organization. And, uh, and this is important because uh, I, I think I'm going to just uh, die if somebody tells me again, you know, oh, this is how Apple does it or this is how Amazon does it. Uh, that's, you can learn a little bit from that, but they are still run by their founders and their founders have huge organizational power. You know, if Steve Jobs wanted to do something when he was alive, we'll see if Tim Cook can actually do it because they have not come up with anything brand new since Tim Cook has been there. They've, they've, they've optimized the existing innovations. And then you look at somebody like Jeff Bezos. Well, if Jeff Bezos wants to do something inside of Amazon, he's got all kinds of organizational power to do it. The challenge here is not to think of, and you know, and to, if you're inside a large organization, like I, I was at the PricewaterhouseCoopers for many years, PwC, that's a 170 year old organization. You know, changing that is different than Jeff Bezos changing Amazon or Jack Ma changing Alibaba. So these are the variables I think you need to worry about. Organization, that is how do you operate a part but integrate it enough so you can scale the business. Second is decision rights, uh, what my friend Kevin Hartley calls death by a thousand paper cuts. Inside organizations, uh, people usually are willing to take all kinds of compromises that eventually kill the product or service so the end customer never actually sees the true innovation. Uh, 
And then the third thing, and this is super important, and I don't know how many of you folks uh, online here are familiar with, you know, thinking about budgets in terms of investment versus expenses, the capital budget versus the expense budget. But it's super, super important to be in uh, be an investment, not an expense. And the reason for that is that the biggest uh, uncertainty in a new growth innovation, I would say, is the time it takes to sell and scale it. So you can be right, but you might be a little off in your timing. It may take a little longer to sell something. The sales cycle might be a little longer. If that's the case, if you're in the capital budget, that'll actually work. If you're in the expense budget, your competitors and your and your uh, and your uh, bosses will will shut the project down because you didn't hit it at the right time. And the last thing is who gets rich. And um, a lot of these organizations that have been successful have figured out a way to give power and rewards to people who really do transform their businesses. So let me go through some of what this means. Okay. So I do this, have a question for you before uh, you start that next part. Yep. The question came up, you mentioned decreasing variance is a challenge in this constant state of disruption. How do we propose an innovation program to decrease the var variance and who should drive this conversation? Yes, well, I, I think that the we actually have to have two processes in a healthy organization, what Mike Tushman called the ambidextrous organization, which is the in the existing business, you decrease variance and drive toward more and more profitability and growth. On the new part of the organization, you actually want to increase variance so that you can innovate and drive uh, new capability. So, uh, for example, there's an organization called Granger, which is a large industrial supplier, a uh, multi billion dollar industrial supply company. Uh, when they came out, um, when the internet first came out, everyone thought that Granger would be roadkill, that they would be like Macy's or be like, uh, you know, the Chicago Tribune, that they would fail because uh, much of industrial distribution is, is an information function, not unlike what Uber does. But what they did is they separated out uh, a group to do Granger.com, and they they kept the operating management in the core. So the CEO and the person was called the CEO of Granger.com was part of the overall Granger team, what we're calling here a balanced org structure, org structure three, but they could increase variance and they could still be integrated. Now Granger, the parent organization that had 535 physical branches was busy decreasing variance. So the executive in charge of that was tasked with decreasing variance, making it super efficient and so forth. The, the, um, the executive in charge of Granger.com, which was a separate division that had its own decision rights and so forth, that person could increase variance. So they could go out and uh, buy search companies. They could go out and hire design talent. They could go out and get new kinds of supply that would get integrated into the base. So it's really about the balance, uh, decrease in the core, increase in the new organization. Dana, did I answer the question? You did, and it sounds like a perfect segue into this slide. Absolutely, yes. And so when you think about, uh, there's a wonderful study by a guy named Tushman, um, and he reported 2004 in the Harvard Business Review, and uh, it's called the Ambidextrous Organization. And in here, what he did is he uh, gave different types of organizing. So let's talk about three of them and, and how successful they were for transformational innovations. So org structure one uh, had uh, you know relatively low uh, integration uh, and and lots uh, oh sorry org structure two had relatively low integration and lots of flexibility. Org structure one was uh, essentially adding additional resources within the functional units. So you know finance got a little bit more uh, capacity, design got a little more capacity, manufacturing got a little more capacity. They stayed where they were and they worked on this project. Org Structure 2 was a completely separate organization reporting directly to the CEO. And Org Structure 3 was an operating division, as I mentioned before, that did have its own decision rights to deal with people and content and sourcing and so forth, but was integrated on a day-to-day -day basis with the management team. So the person at Granger, for example, who was running Granger.com, was part of the normal management team for Granger Corporate. 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, for budgeting and forecasting and for, you know, people development and capital budgeting and so forth, they were all on the same team. It turns out that, uh, at least when I thought about it, I thought Org Structure 2 would be the most successful. Org Structure 2, the separate unit reporting directly to the CEO for this new thing, actually was successful out of 35 instances exactly 0% of the time. So it did not transform the core. It was simply too separate. Then org structure one was the second uh, most successful. That was successful 25% of the time out of the 35 instances that Tushman looked at. And org structure three was successful 90% of the time, nine out of 10 times. So org structure three has that wonderful balance of having enough variance to create new things for your customers and enough integration to take advantage of the scale organization. So uh, that is really the, a, a super important thing when we think of how to organize. And very, very few uh, existing organizations do this. The ones that do it the most are the private equity companies that sometimes do this underneath the umbrella of a holding company. So you know, the management team uh, may have two or three or five divisions and they all work together uh, as a management team, but there's a lot of, uh, of, of accountability and flexibility and decision rights down in the individual units. Uh, but many, many uh, C corporations, including folks like GE, did not go and do this. I would suggest to you this is some of the challenge that GE had in transforming some of its organizations. Okay. Um, then one of my personal favorites is this notion of death by a thousand paper cuts. Now, what do I mean by this? Usually when there's a product market innovation, which takes uh, you know, great engineering, financial, and creative skill to make something new, uh, it often then gets uh, people say, okay, great, you guys did the thinking, now we're gonna do the doing, and you give it to the main organization to scale it. So let me illustrate this with, a, with an example. One of my favorites was a, uh, a, 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 a restaurant I, I love to go to, uh, used to love to go to, called the Low Fat, No Fat Cafe. So, you know, I work out a fair amount. I'm not a bodybuilder, I'm not an athlete, but, you know, I like to eat healthy. So you go into this place and they had the best, you know, um, steamed vegetables and, and cooked egg whites and turkey meatballs and the buffalo burgers from, you know, um, grass-fed buffalo and you know just fantastic healthy food. I mean, you felt 10 pounds lighter just going in there. And when you went in, you know, it was all, it had these delicious air fries, you know, no fat or anything, just nice complex carbohydrates. And so, and then the people who served it to you were mostly bodybuilders, these giant guys, sometimes women too. And they would, you know, be wearing muscle shirts and they sometimes they'd be orange color because they, you know, went to the tanning booth too much. but you know, just people who are really into bodybuilding. And the place had a great atmosphere, tons of, you know, filtered, uh, free water, big glasses, you know, it's just fantastic. So uh, this person had a, a, it was very, very popular, made a lot of money. And this person was approached by somebody who was accustomed to franchising, was a corporate type, you know, taking an idea and scaling it. Well, this person took the low fat, no fat cafe and so they started to scale it out. And when they scaled it out, one of the things they found is, you know, these air fries are really hard to, to make right. You know, you have to really pay attention and so forth, a little bit of capital equipment. So instead of doing air fries, why don't we do a different complex carbohydrate, which is a black bean? Okay, so they put black beans. And then they had, they found out that, you know, doing egg whites at scale, fresh all day long, you know, it's kind of hard. So let's try egg beaters. You know, they're kind of the same, same calorie profile you know, easier to cook, a little more shelf stable, let's do that. And then they said, hey, look, we're a, um, you know, we're a retail uh, food organization. We can't be giving away free water. We should be charging for water and flavored water and all that stuff. So there's no more free water and filtered water everywhere, which to those of you who are, you know, health aficionados, you know, having good clean water is central to health. Um, so by the time I went into the low fat, no fat cafe, a couple of their franchises and you go in and you cannot even recognize it. And each of these is a death by a paper cut, right? And all together, by the time you get there and it's got no air fries and it's got, uh, you know, black beans and it's got uh, egg beaters and it's got, char and they charge you for bottled water just like everybody else. 
you know, there's no personality, there's no nothing. And this is exactly what happens to a lot of innovations inside large organizations. You have this beautiful thing which customers love, and then you say, oh, well, we can't source it this way, and we have to use this talent over here, and oh, by the way, we have to use this marketing organization, we have to buy the supply from these folks, and it's compromised by compromise by compromise by compromise, and this creates the worst of all worlds, because what you have then is customers look at that the way I looked at the franchise low-fat, no-fat cafe, and I say, ah, this thing is no good. But they never actually saw the real low-fat, no-fat cafe. And that's what happens is that people don't see the real thing. So the corporations in the worst place, which is they go, they try it, they kill the thing by a thousand paper cuts, they show it to customers, customers say, ho-hum. Then after that, the organization thinks they've tried the idea and lo and behold, somebody else comes along, some innovator comes along and does exactly the same idea, but does it right, and they win the market. So, um, and, and we can point to lots of examples of that. Take a look at the Kind Bar versus the Nibbles effort at General uh, Mills. If you, if you sign up for the Nibbles snack effort at General Mills, it's just, uh, it's like the low fat, no fat cafe after, um, you know, the, the franchise effort. It just is not the same as Kind Bar and the other, uh, you know, on-demand food capabilities. So, so this five thousand paper cuts is a big deal. Dana, did you want to say something or? Yes, John, I have a question here. So the the question is, death by a thousand paper cuts sounds like a change to the product and service offering as well as the business model. Who makes those decisions, and how do we proactively manage any issues to avoid gutting our business like low fat, no fat cafe? Well, I'll tell you, there's, uh, there's a, 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 that's a great setup for, for where we're going next in terms of being in the uh, capital budget, not the expense budget. So where does this usually come? Uh, well, I was involved with, um, with a, a big uh, pharma company. And what happened was they had a, a, a new division that was going to do behavioral health and get people to change their behavior to improve their health. For those of you who follow uh, the big diseases like cardiovascular disease and diabetes and asthma, but especially the first two, cardiovascular and diabetes. By the way, you have to remember diabetes equals uh, a, a couple percentage points of our entire gross domestic product. It's about six or seven percent of the entire GDP is spent on diabetes. It's crazy. Um, you know, so these are big, big diseases and big, big expense items. So folks were there and um, they have some interventions and they were modeling it out. And what was happening is that the senior executives were wanted to have a more uh, predictable set of uh, projections of uptake and whether or not it would cannibalize the core business. They wanted to make sure that they were buying from the existing organization because you got efficiencies and volume and so forth. And they were wanted to make sure that they were using the existing talent in the business because they didn't want to go out and hire new people. They wanted to use the people they had. Well, those three things right there, spending tons of time on economic models to decrease future uncertainty, to buy from the existing supply base because they wanted to buy you know, from the existing supply base in terms of getting economic leverage, and to not hire new people because they didn't want to go through the hassle and effort of bringing in new headcount and so forth. Those three things right there killed the uh, effort, and I've seen that happen time and time again for the question of who's doing it. It's usually the operating executives who oversee the area that the innovation is pay taking place. And why is this important? I actually tried to cancel one of our consulting meetings because the client wanted to spend more time on the economic model, the sourcing model, and the talent model. And I said, stop already. If you can do the behavioral change you want to do, if you can actually get diabetic patients or people who have pre-diabetes to actually change their behavior, you're going to make a boatload of money. We don't need any more specificity than what we already had. We had good rough estimates of that stuff. So the real thing is, can you do what you think you can do? But the organization, especially the operating executives, want to do it. And the reason, it's because it's in in this particular case, and in many cases, it's in the expense line. Oh, what do I mean by that? It means that your incremental projections are going to be in the core business, your incremental costs are going to be in the core business, and your incremental talent is going to be in the core business in terms of their, the numbers, their overall numbers. If you separate it out the way Granger.com did, which was a capital impact, and it was a capital budget for transformation of the organization, they could hire new people in, 
They had their own decision rights on these things. As long as they were within the projections of what the capital investment was. That's so important because you can be right. And in most of these transformational activities, they were right, but they were often off in terms of the timing. So if you look at uh, even Granger.com, it took a little longer than they thought for the market to develop to really use Granger.com. But when they did, they took it took off like crazy. And so uh, if they had been in the expense budget, they would have said, hey, look, you're not hitting your numbers yet. Whereas in the capital budget, they said, okay, well, we've invested $50 million. We think it's worth another $10 million this year to keep going because the customers are starting to show that they want to do it this way. So the, to the question of where do these things happen? They usually happen by the operating executives and the planners of the existing business. The compromises usually come in terms of, you know, what you can do, where you can, you know, what kind of talent you can bring in, where you can get your supply, and sometimes what you can do with customer data. Those are often biggies. And then you just make little compromise after little compromise after little compromise. And by the time you wake up, you realize that actually what the customer is seeing has no resemblance to our true innovation. Dana, did I answer the question? You did, thank you. Yes, and so we see this here on page 25, this notion of uh, you know, being in the expense budget. And, and by the way, if you, wanna, uh, if you wanna make this real within your own organizations, it's a very simple thing to do. Whether you're doing the uh, present, whether you're doing the uh, pro formas or people working for you are, uh, when I was a professor at Harvard Business School, uh, where I was for 12 years, I did a tremendous amount of work with student teams that were building new businesses. And about halfway through that, it occurred to me that students always came in and they had low, medium, and high volume. So here's the low projection, here's the medium projection, here's the high projection. I'd say that's great. But as I worked with these teams, it became clear to me that there's an additional uncertainty. And this goes back to expense versus capital. The, the really key uncertainty is will the sales cycle, that is how long it takes to get a customer interested, to get them to try it, to get them to buy it, to get them to repeat purchase it, that what the real question, in addition to low, medium, high, is regular, slow, and super slow. So let's say that you're selling an industrial product and you think it's gonna take three months to sell it. Let's say it's gonna take you actually six months to sell it, or 18 months to sell it, especially the early customers. If you ask any of your teams, look, give me high, medium, and low, but give me regular speed, slow, and super slow. And what I would do this with teams, I did when I became a consultant, I did it with consulting teams and with clients. When you do that, when you say, gee, let's take it, instead of taking three months, it's actually going to take six or 18. What it does is it completely changes the way you think about the business. You spend money in different places. You, uh, you don't scale up on certain parts of the organization. You spend more time trying to figure out how you speed the, the, the sale to close. And this is absolutely compatible with this notion of being in the investment budget versus the expense budget, because in investments, people are used to you know, timing, it, disp timing issues. In the expense budget, if, you're not, if you miss it by a quarter, two quarters, three quarters, you're already in trouble. And if you're uh, if you're an experienced uh, politician inside organizations, you know how to take down a competitor when they don't hit their number. You say, oh, well, John had this great idea. You know, yeah, it seems to be going okay, but you know, he told us we'd get 50 million in sales this quarter. You know, now here we are in the second quarter, he's still late. That's very different than the investment conversation. Thank you, John, for that, because I have a question uh, that came up. How do I use, how do I build a business case to become, uh, to be a part of the capital budget versus the operating budget? Uh, that's, that's a very uh, useful question and, and, and really good. The, the first thing you have to sit back is take an honest look at you know, where you are in the power structure. And generally when I talk to people about innovation, there's two kinds of people. There are folks who are um, in, in an innovation group that has a lot of creativity and ability to build things, but does not have a lot of organizational power. And then there are folks who uh, are really uh, power brokers in the organization, and they may be funding that innovation group, but also know how to get capital and get resources and so forth. So they have more organizational power. Now, uh, so the first thing is you have to ask yourself, which of, which of those two people are you and your team? And then the second thing is you have to ask yourself, how ambitious do I want to be? 
I know lots of people who have been inside large organizations who have done very innovative and fun work who never really had a scalable innovation but did important work that lent consumer insight that helped the core. So if that's the, if that's the career you want, you can have that career inside a lot of large organizations. If you aspire to transform the organization and really scale your innovations, then you have to be a student of organizational power because the, the, the creation of the innovation is a product market, marketing, engineering, and uh, business modeling exercise and experimentation. And scaling it is about power and organizational politics. So if you aspire to the second, then either if you don't have access to that directly, you need to go to the sponsors of your organization and so forth, and you have to educate them as to what you're gonna ask for. So let's say like right now, um, you know, you're in the middle of an innovation that's going well with the, client, with the end customer, and, but you, or it's starting to go well, or you believe in it and so forth. Whoever is sponsoring you, you have to go to them and say, look, I'm in the expense budget you know, for this prototype, but if this works, I'm gonna need your help to actually get this to be a separate organization, still integrated, but has its own decision rights. We're gonna to have to be in the capital budget and we're gonna need decision rights because we don't want death by a thousand paper cuts. So as you are building this right now, you have to build the organizational and political power base to scale it using the organization's resources. Now that's more work, it's a higher aspiration, or at least a, a larger aspiration, I don't know about higher or lower, it's a larger aspiration. So, you know, first ask yourself, uh, where are you? Second, ask yourself, what kind of career do you want? Because you can have a rewarding career in either way, uh, but there's, there's no avoiding the politics of scale. That's great. Uh, and that's a great uh, takeaway. Being a student of organizational power, is that something everyone should practice no matter what their level is in the organization? Uh, I, I, I think it's good hygiene. Um, as I say, I think there are a lot of great contributors who work in a small team, uh, who have deep expertise, who just don't want to deal with the organizational power and so forth. Uh, that's fine, but do it consciously. Don't you know, don't, uh, I, I think it's sad when I see people who, who come up with a new innovation and they're frustrated that, you know, they say, well, customers like it and, you know, people should adopt it and we should invest in it. It's like, they don't realize that it's a, it's a power play that they have to do to get it to scale. And, you know, uh, and so if, if you are, if you're not scaling, face it, and understand it and be a student of organizational power and then make a decision, do you want to actually innovate around organizational power or not? But don't be unhappy that it's not naturally scaling because the organization is not built to do different things. You have to do structural variables to get it to do different things. So don't, you know, it's kind of like being at the beach and lamenting the fact when you build a sandcastle, you know, at low tide, it gets washed away. You know, don't, don't lament it, just realize that's how it works. Perfect. Um, the, uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful book by two friends of mine, Paul Lawrence and Nitin Noria. Nitin's uh, the dean of the Harvard Business School right now. That's what you love to hate. He's so capable in so many ways. He's a physicist and then he's an organizational theorist and now he's dean of the Harvard Business School. It's like, you know, uh, who, you gotta hate that guy. And he's, and he's gracious and wonderful, you know, as a human being. So, uh, the, uh, he's, 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 a, he's a fabulous scholar and leader. And so what they find in this book, Driven, is that people are, uh, and this, this has some similar things to Daniel Pink's book, Drive, but in Driven, they, they reviewed tons and tons of research on the, uh, um, the compensation and uh, recompense for people inside uh, organizations. And so what drives people? What do they want from organizations? And they found four fundamental things. They found there's a need to bond with other people, there's a need to learn, there's a need to earn, and there's a need to uh, have some control or to be able to defend, not just, you know, have some control of your work environment, whether or not you're gonna be hired, fired, or whatever. And that these four things are fantastically important. Uh, one of the most interesting things to me in the book was the fact that uh, inside large organizations, let's say that the possible uh, 
payouts for a compensation system are 50,000 to 150,000. So, you know, you've got a paid per performance system that goes from $50,000 up to $150,000. And uh, the average, let's say to make the math easy, is 100,000. So you say, okay, well, you're gonna see some people at 50, you're gonna see some people at 150, and, and then you're gonna see some people around 100. No, it actually turns out that in practice, executives in a compensation system with that kind of possible spread actually only use about 20% of the spread. So almost all the compensation sits between 90,000 and 110,000, that is $20,000 around the mean. And the reason for this is that uh, people, you can show that people are better uh, you know, at a job, give them a little more money, but you don't wanna give them so much money that you create massive uh, hassle for yourself so that you pay the one person who deserves you know, $150,000 at 150, and you get everybody else in the organization complaining to you because of course it all always becomes known. So what this separate division allows you to do is it, al and it allows you to pay people the value they've created. So uh, when Daniel Hamburger was running Granger.com and he left, he left with tens of millions of dollars uh, when Granger folded Granger.com back into the mothership and, uh, because now more than uh, about two thirds of the orders uh, come uh, electronically to Granger. Um, so it would have been next to impossible to pay Daniel uh, $10 million if he was inside the Granger system. So uh, this ability to create, uh, you know, variance that actually rewards the value created. And of course that allows you to, to, to gather better talent as well. Uh, so this, this notion uh, is really, uh, you know, uh, represented usually not inside large corporations, uh, single corps, but in private equity firms, PE firms, they're three times as likely to turn around a troubled company and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they can deal with these structural variables. They can set up a separate entity. They can give you the decision rights. Uh, you know, it's not death by a thousand paper cuts and they and you do get uh, a lot of power and prestige as well as money if you do it right. So uh, I think that there's there's a lot of evidence there. Okay. So um, question before you move forward quickly, um, where, do, where do I go to get help? Um, to scale well what I think, you're describing here sure 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 I, I mean I do think that because um, uh, and I know I know this isn't my own self-interest but I do think that consultants are very helpful and hard to have the conversation it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like doing therapy on yourself some people can do it by reading the books and so forth but most people benefit by going to a therapist I think this is one of those things because it's so hard sometimes to talk about the organizational power uh, in a way that isn't threatening or seeming to be self-serving that um, I think outside consultants can be uh, helpful for this. Uh, I think if you have senior executives who have uh, created these kinds of transformations inside your organization, they also can be helpful because they're usually um, they're usually very wise uh, at hot wiring the organization to get new and different things done. Uh, we did a book on self-made billionaires and um, look for the people who who pulled off things that nobody thought they could pull off and that are commercially successful inside your organizations. And if they will make time for you, they usually can tell you how to hotwire the car so you can, uh, you want car thieves here, you don't want car washers, right? You want people who understand how to hotwire the organization to get what they want in a legitimate way that serves customers. Uh, so. I don't know if that answers the question, Dana. It does, great. Hotwire the organization. And then I think that leads into the next question, which it sounds like you might be going into, how do I get started into building a bionic organization? Yes, well, I think I think um, the the first thing to ask yourself, and and, uh, and I think there's the, the three, three questions go right along um, the three kinds of capital, which is, what do I know about my end customers or my end assets or the combination of their behavior now and in the future? Uh, you know, what are things that I can automate either on the, you know, picking up the trash or looking at the stars part? Uh, and then what networks uh, can I create or be a part of? So let me just give you an example. Uh, when I was chief marketing officer at, at Price Waterhouse in the U.S., about a $13 billion company, we came to the conclusion that we wanted that the entire organization uh, needs to know about 10 million people on a global basis. 
not 100 million, not 1 million. And those people are clients, previous clients, uh, students, employees, alumni, uh, regulators, uh, and so forth. And we set out to build a behavioral model of that those 10 million people using uh, assets inside the firm. We have lots of uh, systems of record that, you know, gee, Dana, how much, you know, how many, how much consulting or auditing or tax stuff do you buy from me? And, you know, were you happy with it and so forth? Those are systems of record inside. And then there's outside stuff, which is, you know, Dana, you go out and, you know, you do a speech or this webinar or whatever, and I can gather that and have a profile of you and your preferences and so forth. So really to marry up that inside behavioral data with that external behavioral data to get to a model of what interests you, what you're trying to do with your career and so forth. This is exactly what every political operation in the world is doing right now. They're building profiles of voters. You can do the same thing. And then if you have assets, there's a company uh, in the US, a large rental company, and they are hooking up every single asset so they know uh, exactly where their assets are, how much they're getting used, do they need maintenance and so forth. That's another example of behavioral stuff. Cognitive stuff we've talked about, and then the networks, every company needs a network strategy. And if they're in the retail consumer businesses, if you don't have a Facebook and an Alibaba strategy, you don't have a strategy. And then in terms of the industrial realm, it depends on the power brokers in those industries. So for example, if you're in, agric if you're in agriculture and agricultural chemicals, you really want to understand what's happening to the information layers, what people like John Deere are doing with the information coming off their tractors and so forth. Okay, other questions? No, please continue, thank you. All right, um, all right so uh, how do you prepare? Um, and this is really why uh, I teamed up with IXL. Uh, there's really this notion of how do you uh, get bigger, bolder ideas? How do you look from the outside in? And that's where the IXL uh, activities around the Innovation Olympics, where you get five uh, teams that uh, compete to work on your challenge or problem and to bring new ideas to bear uh, to really stay ahead of the curve. And um, the, uh, I've, I have not managed one of those teams to conclusion yet, but the ones I've read have been really amazing in terms of the kind of diverse thinking they bring and practical thinking they bring uh, in innov scale uh, implementable innovations uh, that have economic value. Uh, then the second thing is really to retool, really retool the organization, kind of turn the dirt over to make that pipeline go better. Uh, new tools, frameworks, understanding, Bionic is one of those examples, um, you know, so that when an opportunity comes along, you can go faster. And then this third piece really about the strategy and system to build not only internal alignment, uh, but the internal alignment on a way to scaling. So a lot of organizations have aspirations, but they don't have the scaling capability inside. So again, IXL can help across all of those. Uh, great. Um, so you see this um, in terms of the approach. I mentioned the Innovation Olympics, the pursuit and realization. This is how you turn that dirt over, new tools and so forth. And the blitz scaling of innovations, having uh, the scaling capabilities dealing with structural variables. So it's really those three things together uh, that help an organization get started. What's fun is that you've got tangible things at the end of the Innovation Olympics that people can actually see. And you, you know you, you have an unbelievable uh, talent pool addressing that. The pursuit and realization that helps turn over the dirt and prepare the organization to make it stick. And the split scaling innovation is uh, uh, challenging. And I think an opportunity area that those who can figure it out uh, can be ahead of the competition and certainly can progress their own careers. Great, I didn't know, um, let's see. Um, I just wanted to, I don't know, Dan, if there are any other questions, if not, I'll just go um, What in terms of what we have next here. Yes, I, and, and I think this is the perfect segue. It was like, how do we get started with this Innovation Olympics? Great, you wanna take this or you want me to? Yeah, please continue. Okay. So uh, first thing, uh, you have an opportunity to, to book this 30-minute free consultation with us, um, uh, and we'll, we'll find a time to have a conversation to discuss your uh, growth, you know, goals, growth gaps, challenges, things like that, uh, and really understand the digital transformation status, especially around, you know, if you have the product market fit, are you scaling it, or are you still having an issue with product market fit? 
And then, then depending upon you know where you come out of that, uh, of course, uh, it comes up with a plan for next steps. So conceptually, uh, very easy. It has to be uh, tailored to each uh, situation because innovation is a very local and specific uh, set of activities. Well, that is fantastic. We're at the top of the hour right now. I did see a question um, come through, but it's not quite clear. If you could please re-send uh, your question, we'll make sure that we um, finalize and respond to any questions right now. And so, John, thank you so much for this exciting presentation, and thank you all for attending. The presentation will be available to all of you uh, at the end of the session. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.